Welcome back to Paris RB Conf. And I have the pleasure and the honor of um, introducing you, Raphael Franca. One of the main contributors of Rails. You, you, everyone know that. Okay. Okay. So I'm here today to talk to you about what it means to be living on the Rails edge and why would someone want to do that? Like, so this is a history about how we are accelerating Shopify using Rails and how Shopify can accelerate the Rails development. My name is Rafael França. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub on this handle. I'm on the members of the Rails Squad team since, since 2012. And I work at Shopify as a production engineer. We are an e-commerce platform. We are also hiring, so if you want to hear more about this, you can find some people outside in the Shopify booth. And like, if you never saw me in person, like, I'm pretty sure that you saw this before at GitHub. Like, I maintain a lot of projects, Rails, Redis, Rescue, a lot of different projects. So back to my story. Why look at Shopify? So Shopify started around the same time as Rails. Shopify started in 2004, prior to the first stable release of Rails. Our CEO, Toby, was a member of the Rails Squad team at the time, and he started working with Rails even before the pre-release. The Shopify code base was also never rewritten, so it means that we can see the entire story of the Shopify and Rails in the same repository. In this timeline, we have all the important version releases for Rails until now, and also when Shopify was using it. You can see that we were very close to the Rails version for a while. So you can see that we, when Rails released the 2.0, Shopify was also on the 2.0 version. This situation stayed the same until the Rails 3. And in the Rails 3.2, that situation changed a little bit. You can see that we only could upgrade Shopify to Rails 3.2 almost one year after. The same problem happens in all the other releases after this. Like you can see that the Rails 4.2 was only updated one year later, the Rails 5 almost one year later. But now, like Shopify is on the Rails 5.2 even before Rails 5.2 was released. Shopify is also a big application. Maybe it's one of the biggest Rails applications in the world. And we have almost three, 100,000 lines of code. That's code excluded text, with text is almost 1 million. And we have like 1,100,000 of lines of models with more than 2,000 classes. And it's the same for controllers. And we have a pretty good code to test ratio. That's 1.3 for one line of code. And even that Shopify is huge, Shopify was not, never here written, and like, is, like Shopify is since the first version of Rails. It's also in the last version of Rails. So Shopify is on the Rails 5.2 version since January of this year, and in production since March. But Rails was only released in April, so we are using, we were using a version even before the release. And since this month, we are running the test against the Rails 6 version that's not even released. So why live in the edge? To explain why we choose to live in the edge, I need to tell you two histories. One of them is the history of the background queue. 
that is a framework that Shopify built to execute background jobs. They built this framework to migrate from delayed jobs that was a background queue running on the database to rescue in 2010. And it works like this. Like you can define your jobs on the, your app job folder. You include a module of breakout queue real time. You define a perform method. And you can push a job to the queue using the background queue push method. Fast forward some years, Shopify was able to move to rescue. Background queue evolved to be a mature solution with all the learnings that we had from running our high-scale application. And this tool embraced a lot of the rescue strengths while building new things on top of it. In 2012, Sidekick was released as a simple and efficient message system for Rails. We at Shopify at the time we were using rescue, and we said, OK, like, this tool looks interesting. But like we have no reasons to migrate to it right now. With the community embracing Sidekick as the de facto implementation for background jobs really quickly, things like this happens. Like even the rescue maintainers lost interest in the tools, and you can see this easily in this page, given the 1.26 release took almost three years to happen. That is enough to make anyone nervous. Like the tool we invested a lot of time was not only stale, but moving to alternatives would be really hard for us, given all the tooling we built around it. Fortunately, we had developers enough to actually maintain the tools by ourselves, but that may not be your case. In 2014, real Rails released the Active Job Framework, extracted from Basecamp. And Active Job had a similar syntax of what we had at Shopify at the time, but was different in enough that you can notice the difference. Active Job had the, the advantage over our implementation because it was supporting multiple queues without having to change your code. As most of the things released in Rails, active job becomes the patterns. Books, blog posts, and course were all using it to teach the new generation of developers. This starts to reflect at Shopify. New applications started to use active job and sidekick because it was what the people knew at the time. 80 years after, our custom background job framework that we built ourselves had become stale, new patterns emerged, and we end up with a snowflake that few people know how to use and how to change. This situation is similar to, to when you like, fracture a bone, where like, your bone heals in the wrong place. Like, you can still use your arms, but like, it still hurts, and the only way to fix it if with surgeries. So the next story is about the way we send emails in background at Shopify. It was implemented in 2011. So when you send an email, you instantiate your message by calling the action in your mailer, in this case, notify. And with that action, you can call delivery to send an email to the user. Shopify had the idea to monk patch Rails to keep the same behavior, but instead of sending the email right now, they would schedule a background job to send the email later. So we monk patch Rails to instead of returning an actual mailing message delivery object, we returned a custom background mailing mail proxy object that does the same API, but scheduled the job to send the email. The implementation is similar to this, like this is a simplification. 
But we have like a class that receives the Miller class, the message, the method you want to send the stores on the instance. We marshal the message itself and encode using base64. And we get that encoded message and push to our background queue. Our, our background queue grabs uh, the parameters, like decodes the message, creates the proxy object again, and calls the delivery now method. The delivery now method finally called the message delivery method. That's what we want. Till now, everything is OK. The email is based in the background. Nobody is actually get problems because of that. Everyone is happy. But let's zoom in a little bit in the implementation. So we have this implementation that gets a mail object and creates a serialization using the machine dump method. And to those who don't know how Marshall Dump works, like if you have an object, let's say a full class with a value, and you instantiate the object, you dump it, you get the encoded message, and you load, you get the object back. So it's just a way to get your object. It's a sum to a value that can be serialized. But you, you may think, what happens when the object structure changes? Let's say if I need to change my class, and what happens when I try to load the message that was already serialized? I found the, I found the answer for this in the worst way possible. I was trying to upgrade a gem, and I started to see exceptions in productions, and I had no idea what was happening. And what was happening is that a worker with the new version of the gen was serializing the message, but the old version did not know how to deserialize it, and I got the exception. So I can show you in this snippet how that works. Like I have the, re the mail 2.5 version. I try to serialize a message, and when I deserialize using the new version, I get the argument error. This means that I cannot upgrade the mail chain anymore, because if I do that, users stop to receive emails. And like from the same blog post that Rails released the active job, Rails also introduced a way to run background emails. So I think to fix this, I only need to use that feature. And the feature is working in a similar way as the Shopify implementation, like we also have a message delivery object that gets the name of the mailer, the name of the action, and all the arguments, and send to the background queue implementation. This works definitely like instead of serializing the message using Marshall, we serialize the arguments in the same way Rails already serialize any other job arguments. This makes sure that changing object structure don't cause exceptions. The implementation also has the advantage of only doing the work to generate the message in background. So it's not only safer, it's also faster. And to send an email, is called the delivery now method. So this is great. So now I only need to delete my custom code, and everything is going to work. But not really. Remember when I told you about the background queue implementation? So we had made some decisions in the past that made it incompatible with active job. Things like the infrastructure around it does not work with active job classes. Jobs only support one argument. That is not my case. I need to support at least three. Basic features as serialized active record models does not work at all. And the background key was also mutating the arguments. So I cannot guarantee that the arguments I was passing was the same as the argument that I got from the queue. So to be able to upgrade a simple chain, we need to change most of our infrastructure while keeping everything working. 
So, okay, those stories are scary, but why would anyone want to live in the edge? Like, it means introducing more problems like this. I think the main reason is to build sharing, shared infrastructure. We could have avoided all those problems if we had built our infrastructure in the rails itself. Our problems are also other people's problems. As we can see, when we thought that in 2010 we needed a background queue framework, and four years later Rails implemented the same thing, it means that other people need it, and we could have we could have contributed four years before. By building shared infrastructure, you can not only help other people, but also learn from their usage and benefit together from their so solutions. It's also important to avoid snowflakes. When building your solution community, you make sure that what you use is the same thing that people is learning and using. This helps on hiring and onboarding new members. Another reason is to get new features earlier. Even that Rails try to release every single year, being able to run in the last few versions means that you can get all the improvements and features earlier. And one of my favorites is to avoid regressions. Nothing is more frustrating than try to upgrade your dependency just to discover that now your application has bugs and, or is lower. And even that you fix those problems, you are not going to able to benefit from those unless you are in the last version. By running the last version, you will be able to not only get those fixed early, but also to detect those problems easily and help the community to avoid them. Remember the refactoring that Eileen was mentioning yesterday? We already know that it's going to break our application, and we can help her to actually fix those problems. And like another reason to be in the edge is like there is no need to do big bangs upgrades. That means that no more having to stop your entire team for months to upgrade the framework to a supported version. Instead, you make upgrades constantly having when the problems happen. This not only makes it easier to upgrade when the version is out, but also help you to narrow down the reasons your application is now broken. Instead of having to look on more than 4,000 commits, you only need to look in a smaller set. OK, like now convinced you why you should do it, but how can I do it? One strategy is what I call the long running branch strategy. You create a branch. You make all the changes necessary. You merge it. The next step, I have no idea. And after that, you are happy. This may work for some people, but that was not our case. This tweet summarizes what a week at Shopify, actually, one day at Shopify means. And Shopify has hundreds of developers working on the same code base. Create a branch to upgrade the Rails version and keep it up to date is hard because of the conflicts and people introducing new bugs. We needed a way to test the same code base with two different versions of Genius. So we, we used a strategy called dual boot that we got from GitHub. And the dual boot strategy was the best solution for us. It allowed us to run the same code base with more than one version of the Rails in development, tests, and even production. It works like this. You can define two gen files. One you call genfile.next. The other one is the regular gen file. And you can use the bundle environment to actually set which gen file you want to use. This work fine, and is the way the bundle team recommend you to do. But for big applications like Shopify with almost 400 dependencies, keep it the two gen files 
updated are really hard. Like a version of the gen in one gen file can be different of in the another gen file, and that's not what we want. So we used a hack to share the same gen file. I'm not proud of it, but this is a monkey patch on Bundler. And like, I'm not going to show this slide, because what is important is this. We use an variable to say, in the Rails next, we want to use the Rails 5.2 branch. If not Rails next, we use the current version. And now I can run the command using the environment variable. This approach keep possible to do a boot using an environment, but also address the, the issue of the previous approach. The downside is, of course, having to monkey patch bundler. So after discussing with the bundle team, I found a better way to share the gen file. You can have two gen files as the first example that I gave. But instead of having two different gen files, you have a shared gen file that you can evolve using the evolve gen file. So you have the gen file for the Rails 5, and you have the gen file for the Rails next with the next version. And all the shared genes are in a different gen file. In your config boot, you can use the same environment variable to actually select which gen file you want to use. And you can still use the bundle environment, environment when installing the, gen, the genes. So with the dual boot in place, it's possible to run tests with, with the two, both versions of Rails at the same time. So this is an example of a pull request running the Rails next and the Rails normal tests. After we have the, the CI running for both versions, it's time to actually start the upgrade. The first thing we have to do is upgrade our dependencies. And it's important to you to make sure that your dependencies are working with the same version in both Rails versions. And they, it's easy to start right now because you already have a, your test passing with the old Rails version. This is also an opportunity to you to contribute back to the dependencies that don't support the latest Rails version. Some dependencies take some time to update, so it's an opportunity to give back to the community. So given I updated all my dependencies, now I can fix all the tests. This is an example of what happens when we upgrade the Rails version at Shopify. A lot of test breaks. In most cases, when trying to upgrade to a new version, you are going to see many failures. Having the build failing every time is confusing for developers because they don't know if it's day four or it's not. This also makes it harder to identify if the new code being introduced is breaking with the new version or not. So we have to stop the bleeding. And a way we found to solve this problem was to implement a new feature on min test to mark all the tests that are failing on Rails next with this metadata. So we implemented this feature, so it's possible now to, to tell min tests that this test is expected to fail with the new version of Rails. And instead of showing to the developers that the test is failing, it's showing that the, the test is passing. And if, for some reason, you fix the code and the test now starts to pass, this test is now fails to you to tell you you have to remove the tag. And this made it possible for us to get help for other developers around the company and spread the work and not have to do ourselves. And another thing that allowed us to delegate work was the componentization effort. In Shopify, we are breaking the application. It's a huge monolith in smaller applications. So before, we had like one application with an app folder, and all the controllers, all the models inside the app folder. But after that, we created the components that are like Rails engines. They have the old models, views, controllers. They have separate tests. And also, components have metadata 
to tell you who are the owners of that component. So tests that are broken in a component should be fixed by the people that own the component, not by the rail thing. And there is nothing fancy to talk about how to fix tests, like is a number of PRs is as boring as it sounds. You look for a test value in the suite, you run it locally, you figure out why it's broken, you fix it, you merge, Sometimes it takes days to fix one single test, and sometimes you can fix hundreds of tests with a single, single fix. This was an image of me scrolling the Rails 5 issue that we had. This issue took almost one year to complete, and as you can see, we had more than 900 PRs to actually fix all the tests. So uh, after all the tests are passing, we need to get our new version of Rails ready for production. At Shopify, we need to run both versions in production at the same time, what means that sometimes we needed to build some compatibility layers. Rails 4.2, the way the sessions were serialized, was incompatible with the way sessions were serialized in Rails 5. So we had to monkey patch that in our application. But for Rails 5.1, we, we were more cautious, and those compatibility layers were already implemented inside the framework. One of the examples was in, we had to monkey patch the way CSRF tokens were implemented in Rails 5.2 to be able to actually use it at Shopify. So we had this monkey patch in our application. But for Rails 5, we actually implemented this in, inside the framework itself, so more people could benefit from that. So given we have all the test passing, and also we have all the compatibility layers, it's time to actually start to deploy this to production. The approach we took was a gradual rollout, what means that we started with 1% of the servers running with the new version, and we grew slowly to 5% and 10. And after we reached 10%, we made a big jump to 50%. So this whole strategy is good because you can test in a small subset of your users, and you can see if there is something that your test suite is missing or not, and you can hold back to the old version, fix that problem, and deploy again. We also did some benchmarks when upgrading. We use our profiling tool in our production data center. And we provide different servers to compare the results to see if there is no performance regression in the new version. If a regression is found, we revert the deploy, fix the regression in Rails, and we deploy again. This approach gives us enough confidence to me to be able to deploy this on December 23. 7 p.m., almost 8 p.m., and be sure that I was not going to be paged on the Christmas night. So after we deploy it, like, we have to do some cleanups because we end up with a lot of deprecations and feature toggles in our code base. The first thing is to remove all the conditionals, like we have some RuboCop scripts to do this. And after we used the Hubocop script to remove all the conditionals, we had also to fix the deprecations. A small team of four people cannot remove all the deprecations in our Rails applications of that size. So we, again, need help from everyone in the company. Our first approach was considering that printing the deprecation while running the test locally were good enough. but does not, people are really good on ignoring deprecations. So we created a whitelist approach where 
test files have that have the deprecations generate a whitelist, and we ask the team to take care of the test on the components. This is an example, like given that we have some deprecations in our test suite, usually the deprecations are not like this, they are inside the framework. This test is going to generate an YAML files with all the deprecations, so you could fix the deprecation and that's going to update this YAML file until you don't have any deprecation. All those YAML files are inside the components folder, so the owners know they need to fix this. We extracted this tool in, in a project called the deprecation toolkit. It's not open source yet, like it should be, but need, I need to do a final review, and we are going to release this soon. And after we do that, like that's actually starting to prepare to the next upgrade. Like when I remove all the conditionals and fix all the deprecations, now it's easier to me to start uh, the next upgrade. So we had to keep going. My team started to do this three years ago when I joined the company. We started from the Rails 5.4.1 to 5.2 upgrade, and now we are preparing to the Rails 6 upgrade. was almost three years of work of my team to actually get Shop 5 from 4.1 to 5.2. We realized that this job is never going to be done, and the best way to make it easier and also to allow my team to do different things is to make it something constant and with everyone participating. We know that living in the edge has its risks, but with a good test suite, good tooling, and some rules, you can, you can mitigate those risks and enjoy the benefits that only living in the edge can provide to you. One of the things I recommend you to do is to avoid the monkey patches. So instead of actually monkey patch rails or any dependency in your application, it's better to contribute back to the dependencies yourself. It's also important to keep your number of dependencies really small and that you own your dependencies. That means that you understand what you are depending. You can also contribute to them and either maintain them yourselves. It's also important to keep your parallel CI always running. It does not need to be on every commit but maybe once a week or once a month, just to make sure that you have, you know when your application is broken because of a change upstream. It's also important to think about backwards compatibilities. That means if I change something in the framework or people change something in the framework, they should be aware that that's breaking my application so they can create a plan to make it easy for me to upgrade. If you don't report that, like they are not going to know about your problem, so you, you may need to come up with that solution yourself. And maybe you don't have the context to make the best solution. And also, it's important to make it everyone's concern, not only your team, not only a, a one person concern. Everyone, every developer in the company should be concerned about keeping the dependence updated. And don't give up. In the beginning, it's going to be hard, I know. It's frustrating a lot. But remember, once you are in the edge, you and the entire community, you benefit from it. Thank you. As a last thing, like my team is hiring, so if you want to work developing the framework and push Shopify and Rails to the next level, let's talk. Uh, questions? So please stand up if you have questions. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you showed on your reg stats that you have uh, over 2,000 models 
uh, in Shopify. I wonder if they are all active records or you keep something else there with 500 controllers and over 2,000 models. Okay, so I believe most of them, if not our active record models, because we do have a different folder to Ruby classes that are not inherited for active records. So yeah, I think the 2,000 are our active record models. Okay, so we have over 2,000 tables in DB. Yes. Wow, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for your talk. That was really inspiring. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what is your test coverage uh, to be so confident to um, rely on the tests uh, to bump on the next version of Rails? Uh, because we kind of experienced this issue, and we are not so confident that the, the, the failing tests are well representing uh, what will happen in production. I don't have the numbers right now. I believe is around 80% of coverage. We do have some problems that sometimes things were not, not covered by tests in the last three upgrades. And we mitigate that by actually being able to run in production in a smaller set of servers, which means that we could ourselves, like, we could roll out this new version only for servers for Shopify employees, and only Shopify employees get their errors. So what we are doing to improve that is like, it's a continuous work. So every time we find an error in production, we write a test to make sure the test is covering the actual problem. And also at Shopify, we try to have a lot of integration tests. So most of the tests are not mocking what means that we are actually going through all the stack of rails to make sure that things are being stored in database correctly. Uh, I have a question for you. How long does it take to, to run the tests? Oh, that's a good question. So if you're running your machine, all the tests it should take two hours. But we don't do that. Like we run the test on CI, and like our goal is to be in less than 15 minutes. Actually, less than 10 minutes. Right now, I think it's 12 minutes. Uh, Hello. Yes. Uh, can you? Okay. Thanks. Um, it seems that he, I mean it. I think it's probably easier to live on the edge when you're a, uh, like a core contributor to to Rails. But do you think it's something that is feasible when you, when you are not? Yeah, like I can say why you say this. Like I, I used it to think like that seven years ago before I joined the Rails team, and I only got able to join the Rails team because I started to, to do that in my clients. So I was working at consultancy, and like I was working a lot with Rails upgrades. And at that time, I, I had no commit to Rails yet, but I tried to keep things in the last version. And that was what just got me to start to contribute. So yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that maybe it's hard to you to be able to identify where the problem is, but given you are the edge and you are not in a rush to actually upgrade the application, because let's say you are in Rails 5 2 now and you are already running your application against Rails 6 that's not even going to be released this year, you know that there is a failure so you can report the issue right now and people have one year to actually try to solve your problem. And like, and yes. And do, do you have sometimes monkey patches that would become more easily uh, official patches in Rails? Yeah, we do have a lot of patches. I can show you the lib patches folder that we have. Like, it's huge. I try to actually kill most of them. But like I said, like, 
My problem with monkey patch is like sometimes you do workarounds like that in your application, and you kind of implement a different way that is going to be implemented upstream, and changing later may be really difficult, like the two examples that I gave in the beginning of the talk. More questions? OK. Um, so thank you to Raphael.